Uh, now, uh, Paul Jurion will come up and speak. Paul is, by initial training, a social anthropologist, uh, but he moved from social anthropology to finance, and uh, he tells me that it was no great transition, because at the time he made the transition, he was working on artificial intelligence. So perhaps we will have a bit of natural intelligence as well as artificial intelligence as we go through your presentation. Let me ask you please to welcome Paul Jorion. Well, I was blessed by the most inspirational introduction. Um, preparing this, this um, my, my little presentation, I thought, let's try to make some, something good. But after having uh, watched Malika and listened to Elizabeth, I'll, uh, what crossed my mind is, try, uh, let's try to make it even, even better. Um, I worked from 1999 to 2002, I worked for a company called IndyMac. IndyMac had a specialty of home loans, as we call them, and it's more usually called um, mortgages. And um, IndyMac had two specialty. Reverse mortgages, where actually the person who has the mortgage is the owner of the house, and little by little, uh, the, the, um, the house goes back to the, um, uh, to the bank. The other one was called Alte, Alternative A, and uh, Alternative A, I will, go in, 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 I will not go in, into uh, any details, but Alt A is just one notch above subprime. IndyMac is a company which was the third um, major run bank in the history of American finance. A run bank is when people start lining up on the streets, asking for their money to be returned to them. and. Um, that happened on, in July 2008 on a Thursday. Things got wet, but worse on the, um, on, the, on the Friday. And what happened on the Monday is that the bank reopened. It was called IndyMac Bank. And on the main uh, entrance of IndyMac, there was a banner now between the two words. It was IndyMac Federal Bank. The FDIC had taken over the bank in the name of the American government. And was from now on uh, belonging to the, um, uh, to the American government, uh, the company. From 2002 to 2004, I worked for Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo was, is a well-known bank in San Francisco, and uh, it's doing well. Fortunately for, for, for its uh, business, is doing very well. But I was working in the, um, what was called consumer credit. And what consumer credit was doing was essentially Just give me a second. <laughs> Try now. Louder? Yeah. All right, okay. Okay. Um, in 2000 and, uh, 2002, I moved working with uh, Wells Fargo, which, as I said, is a, uh, still a major uh, bank. I was working in a, in a division which is called Consumer Credit, and our specialty was called HELOC. ELOC stands for Home Equity Line of Credit. And essentially at home, if you're not familiar with that, it's a second lien as we call it, a second mortgage you can get on, on a house. The difficulty with the second mortgage is that the first one comes first and that's why it's called a first lien. So when things turned uh, sour in 2008, what happened is that a HELOC had no value whatever. And uh, my... Um, uh, people higher up in the hierarchy than I was uh, lost rapidly their, 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 their jobs. From 2005 to 2007, I worked at, for Countrywide. Countrywide, as you know, is the, the major culprit in the disaster of the uh, subprime industry. A number of people, a number, a number of companies did worse and they fell earlier than did uh, Countrywide. Countrywide is the main, main culprit. In 2008, it was taken over by uh, Bank and of, of America. So these three experiences made me think about finance. I, I imagine that you think that's justified uh, to have come to some thoughts. And I would think, I mean, I had conversations, it was not just on my own, we had conversations at lunchtime between colleagues, and we thought, we're running into some major disaster here, but what, what can we do? This Mr. Uh, Greenspan, who was, as you know, head of the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, for nearly 20 years, from 1986 to 2006, said at that time, he said, um, the head of these companies 
did not think of their self-interest and did not work towards it, assuming that if the head of these companies had worked in their self-interest, um, that would have produced what we call autoregulation, thinking that meaning that the system would go bad and then would recover on its own. And as you know from what you've seen in the news, there's been a lot of discussion lately, uh, 2010 and 2011, about what some companies in particular um, were, were particularly highlighted in that respect, Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank, that when it came to um, saving the whole industry, saving the whole mortgage industry, or try to save their own bank, these companies chose to save their own bank, even at the det detriment of the whole industry a a as a whole. So what, what I start thinking at that, that time, and as I said in discussion with colleagues, is what can we do, what can we do to prevent from within finance uh, that such disaster happens again? And I started thinking about diff 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 different ideas. And in, two, in, in September uh, 2008, which is just, just literally one month before I got dismissed by, uh, uh, by a Countrywide, I was part of the first load, the first batch of people who were uh, let go. Uh, at that point, I think it's about 30% of the people in the company were, were, were let go. And a couple, as I said, uh, maybe four or five months later, the company was simply taken over by Bank of, of America. And I thought, at that time, of, of, of what, 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 what should we do? And then, as I said, one month literally before I was let, let go, I, I, I wrote a piece uh, an opinion piece for the French daily Le Monde. And I called that piece, I called it a constitution for the economy. And my, my idea was that we needed to find an exit out of the situation, we, but we needed to find an exit, let's say, at the highest possible, possible level. And let me here pause a little uh, to, to tell you exactly what, what I started thinking about. A long time ago, a long, a long time ago, a person, uh, person that's his, who is, is historical, or maybe he's not, but anyway, the story is a beautiful story. A person called Moses came down from the mountain, and uh, from the mount, and he was holding um, the uh, tables of, of the law. And I'll just take one of the commandments. There were 10 commandments of these tables of the law, and one said, thou shalt not kill. And to hook up what I'm saying with some earlier discussions today, there's an, there was an alternative here. First alternative was to wait patiently that people would reform themselves unless there was no danger anymore that anybody would ever be tempted to murder his neighbor or part of, the, of his family or whatever. Or there was the alternative of maybe having a prohibition about it. Personally, I think that the idea of Moses or God, if he was directly inspired by, by God, I think it was a great idea. I think we really um, uh, saved a lot of, of time. A little other historical anecdote. During the French Revolution in 1792, a person called Saint-Just, one a historical f uh, figure in the French Revolution, he came up with the idea at some point, 1792, it was the worst of the, um, of the French Revolution. There was a, in, uh, a civil war in France, nearly everywhere, in, in Nantes, in Lyon. There, was, uh, uh, there were uh, external wars on all the, the borders of, of the country. And Sanchez had prepared a, this, a, a speech where he said, what we need to do is reform the individuals, which was essentially the, 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 the line that had been taken by the French Revolution and, until then. But at the same time, we have to do that in parallel with changing the institutions. He started speaking, he was booed, he was, it was the end of Robespierre, who was his friend. It was finished, he never read that uh, particular piece. He was arrested the following day, and he was decapitated a couple of days later. The idea was essential, but it came, it came pretty, pretty late. So what I was thinking is that the following. I thought finance, finance is extremely useful. It, 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 it provides a bloodstream of the, um, of the economy. It, it has two functions which are essential, one which we, we call price discovery, and price discovery is essentially finding people who need money in order to either start a business, do something, or even sometimes just to consume, and bring these people together with other people who have some capital that they can dispense of for a period of time, may, may make these people meet and to make it possible to work that way. Another function which is essential to full finance is the, insur is the insurance uh, principle. A large institution like a bank can, can actually 
damp the, 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 the individual shocks of some little uh, drama ha happening here and, and there, and for uh, p paying a premium, you can actually spread that uh, risk over the uh, whole uh, system. So this is essential. But there are other parts in finance that went really wrong. And so what I was thinking is not, not like some people say, let's close all stock exchanges, or let's eliminate all um, all uh, derivatives, which are particularly in financial instruments, or let's tax every possible um, financial transaction. I was thinking of something more specific. Let's find a way to carve out very delicately, let's carve out exactly the part which is useless and dangerous and remove that part from the rest. What, what makes a part in finance dangerous? One is what we call uh, systemic risk. Systemic risk is the, 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 the fragility of the whole system, making that the contagion effects are multiplied and, 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 uh, um, and are enhanced by, by the, the whole way that the, the system works. The other danger, the other danger is, is, is the following, and here I'll just give you an, an example. And that example will, um, that example will ex explain exactly what, what I, I got in mind. In 2008, in the first part, half of the year, at the very beginning of the period, there was the price of a barrel of oil was $45. On the 1st of July, it, was, it hit, during one particular day, 147. That was more than trebling the price. It was a major crisis. Um, nobody much in the American government bought it except one, one party, and that party asked for an investigation to be started. That party, and that's a bit surprising if I tell you, it was the Pentagon. Why was it the Pentagon? Because the Pentagon has to make reserves of fuel and uh, for the boats, for the planes, etc. And the Pentagon wanted to find out what, what happened. The investigation found out who were the culprits. And the culprits were not dark people in, uh, in, in dark clothes. Uh, they, were, they were pension funds, they were uh, endowments from universities, they were hospitals, they were uh, museums. Why did they go into that business of going into the market and making all these prices being, uh, being lifted? Because they feared for the dollar. They had some assets, assets and they feared that the value of these uh, assets would depreciate. So they moved in massively into the markets. And the instruments were, that which helped them doing that were of special nature. They're called baskets. Baskets, why? Because it's not only oil you find that you can buy in that particular perspective. They make baskets, meaning that they add metals like copper. They are, there's some food. Uh, there's cereals like 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 uh, wheat. Uh, there's cocoa. There's coffee. Uh, there's cotton. Whatever you you want to think, to think of. And when the price of oil was lifted, the price of all these commodities was going up simultaneously. Why? Because people were buying these these baskets. Baskets. What did it lead to in December of 2008? It led to some hunger-driven um, riots in some uh, uh, countries in, in the world, in Indonesia, in Haiti, in some parts of Africa, and, and so on. When the committee, the Senate committee, called these people to explain what was going on, they moved out of these markets. Why? Because of the stigma. They didn't want to be in the, uh, in the limelight. They didn't want to be uh, called there to testify about what's going on. They all moved out. What happened? The prices, all the prices dropped suddenly. They dropped so low, they dropped so low, that actually what happened is that in the process, the producers in Africa of cocoa, the producers of coffee all over the world, et cetera, were hit by that. They were hit by that. Why? Because the prices at that point were going, going too low. So what does that mean? It means that the price going up, we're killing the consumer because it's you and I at the filling station who are paying for the price of the fuel going up. When it comes down, it's a, you as a consumer, I mean, it's the producers who are being hit by the, the process of going down. There was something even more, I would say, tragic in, in, in terms of what we're concerned with today uh, in the process of coming down. When the prices of oil comes up, it's interesting financially to start, have startups on, on renewable energy because it be, the price of oil goes up and it becomes more interesting to go into research to see how to replace oil. When the price of oil dropped suddenly back to the level of 45 from 147, a lot of these startups who were working on renewable energies were eliminated. I hope you understand what I've got in mind when I'm, I'm talking about this. 
but I thought about what would be a, one of the essential, major, central principle of the idea of a constitution of economy. When I say constitution of economy, I mean indeed something that applies to the world as a whole. I think that's where we need, we need to go. You can call it ta tables of the law, and you can think of adding an 11th t t commandment or maybe a 12th and so on. What I thought is one thing you need to do is to prohibit these wagers, which are done by individuals, by company, wagers on the evolution of price. It is one part of finance. It's a very essential part of finance nowadays. In 2007, bef just before the crisis starts, 47% of the GDP in the United States, 47% is constituted of financial operations. Out of these financial operations on the commodities markets, the proportion varies. It varies between 80% and 90% of the activity on these commodities markets currently being done in the, in the perspective of these wagers about fluctuation of prices, what is one aspect of what you, we call speculation. So what I was thinking is the, the part to carve out of finance, to go back to a financial market which serve the economy, the part to carve out is that part which is useless dangerous, takes a lot of um, money out of the economy. Just one remark. Some, some people criticize this idea I've been ex expressing, say, if you do what you say, too much money will go back into the economy, maybe leading to inflation. I think that's a risk we, we can take. Okay. The objection to what I propose is that prohibition of bets, wages on the evolution of prices the main objection is saying it's impossible to implement, it's too complicated, not everybody will agree to do it at the same time. There's a major response to that, as the main response is the following. FASB 133. FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board of the United Nations, the rule number 133 is doing that carving out that I'm telling you about right now. It is there in that particular text. What's the purpose there? To make a difference between people who are useful to the economy and the people who are detrimental. What is the purpose of the rule? To make a difference in taxation. People are doing the, the, what those part that I suggest to be removed altogether are taxed more. But when I'm being told it's impossible just to define what we needs, needs to be done, it's already there. It's already in FASB 133. And something more. Something more. The pro a prohibition on the evolution of prices was part of the law of the majority of countries in the world in the 19th century. It was removed. The article in penal law in France is article 421, and it says exactly what I'm saying. It's forbidden to make wagers on the evolution of prices. That's the way it's been labeled. It's been removed in 1885. I've been going into the history of this, of this evolution. What happened exactly? It's always the same explanation. Under the pressure of the business community, these rules were removed. And at some point, when some, move, some countries started removing it, the other people, the business community in the other country says, we are at a disadvantage now. We can't do that anymore. I close on that. I think it's not only possible, it's already in the text in some way, some articles in the law were there, they have been removed, they can be reinstated. What I'm suggesting we need to do, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't inform individuals, it needs to go together. And it would, what I'm suggesting is only possible if a large number of individuals reform themselves enough in order to say we need to take a, a measure of that type. What I'm suggesting is thou shall not wager on the evolution of prices. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.